Homesteaders, Gardeners, and Cooks. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to Miles Away Farm. Thanks for joining me on my back porch. Uh, yesterday, I was watching Roots and Refuge on YouTube and just did a video that was kind of her top tips for homesteaders. And it was part of a collaboration that she was doing with some other YouTubers out of the Eastern Tennessee area. And I'm in Southeast Washington, and so I'm not anywhere near those guys. And I obviously have a very tiny little YouTube channel, but I really loved the prompt. I loved the question. And so I thought I would throw in my two cents, even though nobody asked me. Our homesteading journey started when we moved to Colorado in I think 2001 and we bought a raw piece of land and built a house, put in a road, put in septic, put in a well. So basically from complete scratch. And we were there for about 10 years and then we moved to Northeast Washington. So up north of Spokane to a 20 acre piece of property up there. Um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. And it was an amazing property in some ways, and it was not a good property in other ways. And then we are now in Southeast Washington in Walla Walla, and we're on just a little four acre piece of property. So we've now had three different properties that we've basically homesteaded on. And so my first tip for homesteaders is not surprisingly, location, location, location. There's a lot of things to take into consideration and obviously price is the first thing. Everybody is always looking at real estate prices and trying to find something that is actually within their budget. And then after that, usually the consideration is how close am I to family or how close am I to places that I've lived, things that I've known, things that I'm comfortable with. And the reality is sometimes you have to move out of your comfort area in order to be able to afford property. And that's just the way it is. Because sometimes your homesteading property may just not be available to you in the place that you're in. I lived in Boulder, Colorado for a while in my late 20s. And there's no way I ever would have been able to have owned property in Boulder, Colorado, even in the late 90s. It was just way out of my reach. Uh, I was not going to be somebody who was going to be making over $100,000 a year. And there was no way I was ever going to be able to afford to live there. And so I left. But other things to consider when you're looking at property, obviously, is climate. And the second property, actually the first property and the second property that we owned, the first property was at 7,000 feet. Uh, so we were very high in elevation and we had about a hundred day growing period. So between the last frost in the spring and the first frost in the fall. So very short growing season and very high elevation. And so our nights, even in the dead of summer, were usually still in the 40s. It made it very, very hard to grow warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers without all kinds of season extension. When we moved to the property in north of Spokane, little better growing climate, not a whole lot, not as much as I had anticipated. Elevation and moving north can sometimes affect that a lot more than you think that's going to. And it was an old house. It was built at the turn of the century. It was uninsulated, basically. It had an amazing root cellar that I miss to this day, but it was really hard to keep warm. We actually had sometimes ice on the inside of the plugs, you know, the, where you, the little screw is that holds the plug plate in. Sometimes there was ice forming on that little screw because it was so cold from the air coming through that wall that it was actually condensing the moisture that was in the air. So incredibly cold in the winter time. And the well on that property was three gallons a minute. And three gallons a minute is not a lot of water. And it was the third well that had been dug on the property. So they had two additional wells that had failed. And then this was the third one at three gallons a minute. We had the property for seven or eight years. We only lived there for a couple of years. And then we rented it out for seven or eight years. And by the time we sold it and it had moved to another property owner, I talked to him right before he sold it again. And that well was down to one gallon a minute. So essentially untenable for uh, any kind of gardening that was any kind of volume. And there wasn't enough water catchment with rain because it was Eastern Washington, less than 20 inches of rain a year. So that was kind of a non-starter as well. So definitely something to consider. We knew that going in, we loved the property for a lot of other reasons. And so we bought it anyway. And the reason we sold it was because it simply was not good farm country, both because of the climate. Um, it was a little snowier and colder than we had anticipated and because of that well. So we are now in Southeast Washington and on a 
a much smaller piece of property. We're only on four acres, but a glorious growing season and really great soil and a really good well. So those things matter and it's definitely something to take into consideration. Also, if you plan on doing any kind of side gig homesteading where you're gonna be selling products from your farm or you're maybe gonna to go to a farmer's market, where you choose to live is gonna make a huge difference in your ability to do that successfully. Because if you're in a small rural area where a lot of other people are also doing the same thing that you are, they aren't necessarily going to want to buy your handmade soaps or your sweet corn because they're doing those things themselves. Or even if you sell to them, you're not going to be able to sell very many just because the population base is small. Um, or if you're in a really rural area that doesn't have a lot of um, high income demographics, they simply won't have the money to support your business. And so those are all things to take into consideration. I started doing farmers markets um, in Spokane my first year when I was up there and then I moved down here to Walla Walla. The first farmers market I did in Walla Walla, I made more money than I had made at any of the farmers markets that I had done in Spokane over the course of the previous year because Walla Walla is a more affluent region and so people had money in their pockets. It's a wine area and so there's a lot of tourists and a lot of people with money in their pockets. So that's also something to take into consideration. You can go to county building departments and find out things like what is a typical well depth around here? Are there water issues that I should be aware of? What's the smallest I can build without a permit? They usually have a square footage on that which is usually not very big. It's usually somewhere under 200 square feet. But if you're thinking about tiny houses and things like that, sometimes you can you know tweak that kind of stuff and then pay close attention to other restrictions i have a cousin who is in idaho and they bought a little piece of ground outside of moscow idaho i'm not sure which county she was in and they put up just a little cabin you know like one of those little buy and put on your property cabins probably less than 200 square feet i'm sure and the county would not let them use it because it did not have electricity it did not have plumbing and they can considered it a dwelling and those two things were actually required in order to be on that property as a dwelling. So they couldn't have been off grid with a composting toilet in that county even if they had wanted to because the county restrictions didn't allow it. So those are also things to take into consideration. So location really important. You know, and it can take a while. It can it can definitely take a while to find your dream property. My second tip and these are in no particular order are you can do hard things. You know, there's a lot of romance around homesteading. We all, you know, love animals. We want to have fluffy chicken butts and eating, a, you know, an egg from our own chickens and maybe milk from some of our dairy animals. But the reality is if you have livestock, you're also going to have dead stock. Sometimes animals are going to die. Sometimes they're going to die unexpectedly. Sometimes they're going to die because of things that you did that you didn't realize were an issue. We raised sheep for quite a while and we were raising a, a variety of hair sheep called American black bellies. And we had had very little problems with any kind of disease or parasite issues. They were great mothers. We didn't have any problems with birthing. That was part of why we chose the breed that we did. And then we brought in a ram. We did a ram exchange to get some new genetics from somebody on the other side of the state. And that ram brought in barber pole worm, which is a parasite. And barber pole is pretty ubiquitous. It's just in the environment. And so it wasn't like this person had been a terrible steward of their animals or anything like that. But this animal came in with it. We didn't realize it. We didn't uh, isolate because again, they're really hardy stock. We thought it wouldn't be a big deal. We let him out in the herd. That spring, we lost three quarters of the lambs that we had to barber pole worm because it took it one, we didn't even know to look for it because we'd been raising sheep for five or six years and we had never seen it and never had a problem with parasites and so we didn't even recognize what was happening and then also because of the type of sheep we had they were very hard to handle they have a lot of good wild instincts and so we weren't getting our hands on them and looking at their the you know the underside of their eyelid for anemia and things like that because they were just not easy to get a hold of and we ended up losing a ton of babies that spring and it was absolutely devastating and at one point I wanted to just sell the herd and stop altogether so if you have livestock Stock, you're gonna have dead stock hard things are gonna happen um, we had a couple of dogs who killed lambs at one point um, we've certainly had animals predated due to raccoons or fox we've had definite fox problems over the years 
Most of this comes down to timing, well-placed wire, good structures to, to keep everybody secure. And every time something goes wrong, you learn from it and you recover and you do better. Um, and But man, does it sting. And there can be sometimes a week or two where you're still just roiling after um, the death of an animal that you didn't see coming. Um, so definitely. And honestly, it goes the same thing for gardening. Things happen. Animals get out, get into your garden, eat your plants. Um, the reason we don't have goats is because we did have goats briefly. And about once every six months, a goat will manage to break through a fence or a gate. And then they eat that small apple tree that you'd only had in the ground for a year. And, and they bend it literally broken off in half because they're trying to reach the top. Sometimes it's garden stuff, sometimes it's garden pests. I don't generally grow winter squash here because we have a pretty bad squash bug problem and it's just too heartbreaking to get, you know, three quarters of the way through the season, you think you're gonna get a crop and then the squash bugs just devastate the plants. But you can do hard things. You learn from it, it makes you more resilient and it makes you learn what to look for so that the next time you don't end up in the same situation but know going in that it is going to toughen you up. There are going to be very hard moments for sure. I'm guessing that a lot of people who are watching this decided that they wanted to homestead because they want to be self-sufficient. That is always the catchphrase. I want to be self-sufficient. The reality is you're never going to be 100% self-sufficient. And there's lots of threads that you can pull on this. I'm not going to go into deep down the rabbit hole on it. But as an example, you want to be self-sufficient so you have chickens and you're getting your own eggs. But where's the feed coming from for those chickens? Most likely it's coming from a feed store. Maybe you do a lot of baking and you want to be self-sufficient so you're making your own bread which is fantastic and so much healthier for you um, and maybe you're even grinding your own wheat berries um, which is a whole nother step up in terms of, of that kind of self-sufficiency but you're using probably electricity to grind those wheat berries if you're not more power to you because hand grinding wheat berries is very hard and a lot of labor and that's way beyond my personal level of necessity unless I absolutely had to but the reality is you're probably not growing your own wheat that wheat is probably coming from somewhere and you're getting it in the mail or you're getting it at a pickup or you're buying it at your local uh, natural food store. I'll put a link down below. The Homesteady folks did some really fun kind of deep dives into this with some surveys, talking to people that had, were brand new to homesteading, that had been homesteading for five years or more, that had been homesteading for 10 years or more, and had them estimate like how self-sufficient do you actually think you are? And the reality is even people that had been doing it for 10 years or more, you know, they were maybe somewhere in the 80 to 70 to 80 percent range so you're never going to be 100 percent self-sufficient and that means that you should double down on building your community from the beginning and so meet your neighbors talk to your neighbors figure out what you're good at that they're not and what maybe they're good at that you're not and barter and trade and also just resign yourself to the fact that you're still going to always want chocolate and coffee and there's no way you're ever going to be able to have those things in a pinch could you get self-sufficient to the point where you could survive? Yes. But would you be losing out on a lot of the joys in your daily life, like coffee and chocolate and things like that? Probably. So, you know, just know going in that self-sufficiency is essentially always going to be a moving target. And honestly, I don't think it's the goal. I think the goal should be community sufficiency, not self-sufficiency. And that is really what I've spent the last 20 years of my life working towards. Going into this, it's very helpful if you can have a, a flexible mindset and a perspective shift on things that you bump up against that are difficult. As an example, what you eat. When I was a kid, I was a super, super picky eater and I basically would eat uh, corn on the cob, canned green beans, iceberg lettuce with Thousand Island dressing. That was pretty much it for the vegetables. And sometime in my mid 20s, as I started doing more cooking and a little bit of gardening, I started to realize that basically I had told myself when I was five or six or seven years old that I didn't like something and I had never really tried it since. And so I had to go back and relearn and retry basically every vegetable that was out there. 
And there are still things that I don't love that I'm not gonna get super excited about cooking every day, but I have added so many things to my diet because I was willing to be flexible and to keep trying over and over again. My goal became I wanted to have one recipe for each vegetable that I didn't just tolerate, but that I actually looked forward to eating. And so like roasted carrots for me was one of those things. Regular carrots in soups and stews and things, they were fine, but I didn't look forward to them. I can eat an entire sheet pan of roasted carrots in a sitting and be so happy because they're so delicious. So having that perspective shift and that flexibility in your mindset, and that also comes with learning new skills. You're going to be bad at things at the beginning oftentimes. I love Brene Brown and she has this whole piece on what she calls FFTs. And an FFT is effing first time. And basically the message is every time you do something for the effing first time, you're probably gonna be terrible at it. That also includes things that maybe spring up on you. And so you don't expect them to happen and they happen and you're terrible or you don't react well. And it's because it's the first time that that's ever happened to you. And you haven't had time to process it. You haven't had time to figure it out. And so giving yourself grace, having some perspective shift and recognizing, okay, I can do hard things. I'm gonna come back and try this again and just keep doing it until you get it right. Or maybe you do it a couple of times and you're like, no, this is not for me. And that's also okay. Which comes down to my next one, which is make homesteading yours. I think there's a lot of, you know, we're all watching each other. We're all kind of in our own little homesteading echo chamber where I'm watching your video, you're watching her video, she's watching my video. We're all feeding on each other's energy and information. And the reality is maybe somebody is doing sourdough beautifully and like Farmstead on Boone is a great example. Her sourdough stuff is incredible. I'm never going to be that sourdough person. I've done sourdough. I can do sourdough. I don't eat a lot of bread. Bread is not really my friend. I have a hard time with um, grains in terms of my diet. It makes me gain weight like crazy, even if it's organic, even if I'm grinding it myself. Um, I just do better in terms of my diet when I'm not eating a lot of grains. And so sourdough is not for me. I actually had one that was stuffed into the back of my fridge that I was cleaning my fridge out this January and found it and it was sad and dry and a mess and I threw it out. And I may do sourdough again one day, but I just, I let it go because even though homesteaders are supposed to do sourdough because that's the thing you do, um, it really wasn't fitting our lifestyle. And so it really wasn't who we were. And so just recognize, like make it your own. And this also really comes in with gardening. And you've probably heard this advice from many other homesteaders over and over again, anybody who's been gardening for any length of time, grow the things you already buy at the store. If you never eat turnips, don't plant turnips or maybe just plant a few and see if you like them and play around with them a little bit, but don't put in, you know, an entire raised bed of turnips if you've never eaten a turnip before. You know, grow the things that you really like first. Grow the things that are costing you the most money to buy at the grocery store first. So berries are a great example, raspberries and strawberries and blueberries, if you can do blueberries. Blueberries are tricky because of the soil issues. Um, but you know, grow the things that, that are you're spending the most money on at the grocery store, grow the things that you really enjoy. Don't just grow Kajari melons or cucumber melons because you've seen somebody else do it. It may not be your thing or try it. And if it's not your thing, it's okay if you didn't like it. Yeah, don't feel like if you're not doing what somebody else is doing, you're somehow failing as a homesteader because that's definitely not the case. You can do a lot with a little. And so being creative is another one of those homesteading skills. And actually, this is probably one of my very favorite things. The farm that we bought up in North Spokane, that was a hundred plus year old property. And even though they had had an auction and it had been cleaned out quite well, there was still a lot of old lumber laying around. There was old pieces of tin laying around and there were some stashes of things that we found that they had missed when they were doing the clean out. And then, you know, you can find things. You find things on the side of the road. You find things at estate sales or thrift stores. You see your neighbor getting rid of something and say, hey, can I have that? I built a cold frame out of old straw bales, some wood lumber that was laying around and some old windows that I found. I made a little wooden bench out of just lumber that was laying around on that property that I actually still have to this day. And it is amazingly sturdy and I'm so proud of it. And it didn't cost me a dime. 
when we gardened in Colorado, we put in um, raised beds in that location. And my goal was to not have to spend any money on any of the raised beds. It took me three years to get all of those raised beds in because every piece of lumber that I used, I scrounged. I either took apart old pallets or I found things on the side of the road and I built them myself one at a time. And so it took me three years to get all of those beds in. I had a design, I knew where I was going, I knew what I wanted to do, but it took me a total of three years to, to put those in. So have patience with yourself and be creative. There's incredible information out there on YouTube. It is probably one of the best things about YouTube is the creative information that's out there on things that you can repurpose, reuse, and um, reconfigure to something that you need. Honestly, in some ways, I would be more likely to buy a piece of property that was a little bit junky than one that was pristine and perfect for that reason alone, especially if you're on a budget. This one is, you, you've, if you watch my videos at all, you've heard me say this multiple times, and I just, I can't emphasize it enough learn to cook from scratch. If you are thinking that you are gonna to learn to cook from scratch when you have a homestead, so when you get that piece of property that is your dream property and when you put in that garden and then you're gonna start cooking those vegetables from scratch and making meals from scratch, it's very unlikely that that's actually how it's gonna play out because it takes a ton of work. It takes a lot of work to do a garden. It takes probably twice as much work to preserve what you've got once you've got it. And so learning to preserve, learning to cook from scratch, do that when you've still got other things going on. Don't do it when you know you put in 15 tomato plants because you were so excited to finally be able to have a garden space and grow tomatoes. And now you have 15 tomato plants worth of tomatoes and you're really not sure what to do with them. Go to the farmer's market, go to a you pick, grow something on your back porch in a, in a pot, but start learning to cook from scratch now rather than when you actually are on the homestead and in the thick of it. What we don't think about is the mental energy that it takes to learn something new. It takes a lot of mental energy to learn new things. And so facing down 15 tomato plants worth of tomatoes, when you already know how to make a tomato sauce from scratch, is a way different thing than facing down 15 plants worth of tomatoes when you've always just bought tomato sauce in a can or a jar at the grocery store. So cook from scratch, do it now, start it small if you need to, but that is my biggest piece of advice. And it's honestly, it's the whole reason I started this channel. Okay, a few more. Celebrate the wins. I'm a fan of podcasts and I listen to one called Freakonomics. It's one of my favorites because it's all about psychology and business and economics, which sounds like a weird combination, but it's actually totally fascinating. And I'm a small business owner. And so that's part of why I listen to it. But they have this great episode called Why Is My Life So Hard? And it's all about the psychology of how we are designed to focus on the headwind and not the tailwind. So sometimes we have a tailwind, life is easy, life is grand, we finally reach some goal that maybe we've been striving for for a very long time. And we enjoy it for a short period of time and then we immediately start focusing on the headwind again. It's just how we're designed psychologically. It's, it's part of the human condition. And in order to combat that, the number one thing that you can do is practice gratitude on a daily basis. And so basically taking notice of the small things, taking notice of the wins, even if it's just a little thing. Like today, we've had a really bad cold spell. Temperatures have been below freezing during the day for over a week, which is very unusual for here. And so everything's just been icy and cold and we've been trying to keep animals watered and keep everything from freezing and exploding. Um, and it's been absolutely miserable. Today, it was sunny, the, the snow is melting. I took my dogs out and went for a walk. The snow is melting off of the driveway and off of the front porch, and it is glorious. Like, I am so grateful for this day. And partly it's because I went through the hardship of the last week and a half. But I notice little things all the time, and so does my husband. We are both trained biologists, and we will literally go and get each other from whatever the other person is doing and say, hey, come here, you gotta see this. And maybe we're showing each other you know, a robin nest um, or part of a, a robin egg that we found on the ground that's you know, because the baby robin hatched out and the egg shell is still sitting there, um, or a really cool insect that we saw, or a flower that's finally started to open up and bloom. Um, we literally, every day, 
Okay, we're, we're noticing something. We're celebrating the small, beautiful wins of just living on a piece of ground and being blessed enough to steward it and steward it well, we hope, uh, doing our best to steward it well. So celebrate the wins. And as part of celebrating those wins, reassess. Like every year, sit down and really think about like what worked, what didn't, what am I ready to let go of? What do I want to double down on? Reassessing so that you're not just on this endless treadmill, because I can guarantee you that to-do list that you have on your homestead, it's never going to be done. I hate to break it to you. It's, some things will get crossed off, but new things are always getting added. That to-do list is never going to be finished, ever. It just doesn't end. Um, that's part of being on a homestead, is that there's just always something else to do. And so reassessing and figuring out what's not working for you anymore on a yearly basis, really important. I do this every year with my garden. I take an inventory of all of my garden seeds um, just about this time of year deciding what I want to plant more of next year and what I don't. And sometimes I just drop things all together. Um, I went for quite a few years where I didn't grow eggplant at all uh, because I just was tired of eggplant. I pretty much don't grow winter squash because it was too hard to fight the squash bugs. I'm thinking about getting ready, rid of my Marion berries, which are a type of blackberry, just because our winters are just a hair too cold and they produce on second year vines. And so every year I, I grow them hoping for a crop and I get a little bit of a crop and or it gets too cold and I don't get anything. And then they just kind of melt because they're ripe right at the height of the heat of the summer and the berries don't hold up well. And I'm I'm just, I got six or seven years into these Marion berries and I don't think I've ever really had like a banner harvest. And like, why am I spending my time on that? There's probably better things that I could do with my time. So reassessing um, every year and also what's working. Like, that was incredible. Let's do that again. Let's do more of that. I love that. Um, or letting things go. There's a, a whole process called holistic farming. Um, I'll put a link down below and stick something up on the screen here. It's it's all about farming as a business, but it's farming not just looking at the dollar sign bottom line, but also looking at the non-quantifiable things, like what is the quality of life that you're getting for you, for your kids, for the land that you're stewarding. And one of the things that the a holistic farming method has as you do is every year at a certain time you sit down you reassess um, what worked what didn't and you recommit yourself for the following year to farming again and so it really is a yearly commitment instead of just I'm on this treadmill and I can't get off um, because sometimes it's time to get off it's okay to change your life and do other things as well I'm kind of in that process now I'm 57 we're getting ready to retire and we're thinking about, you know, what is this gonna look like in 10 or 15 years? Um, because we've been doing some form of homesteading for the last 20. Wherever you go, there you are. You know, don't expect a change of scenery to fix the internal part of you. Being a human being on this planet is a lot of work and it's a lot of introspection and a lot of heartache sometimes and a lot of facing hard things. Basically, you're gonna take all of the good and all of the bad with you how you approach life is probably not going to radically change just because you're on a dream homestead property. Just know that you are still going to be you even if you're in a new destination and a new location. And then the last one, and it just kind of goes with everything that I've just said, is give yourself grace. Treat yourself like you would treat a good friend. We are so hard on ourselves. The things that we think to ourselves and say to ourselves are the kind of things that we would never say to our children, that we would never say to our best friend, that hopefully we would never say to our spouse. Treat yourself with the same grace that you would treat the other people in your life that you love. So give yourself grace when you fail. Give yourself grace when you succeed. Celebrate the wins. Mourn the losses. It's okay to feel sad when things don't go well. It's okay to reassess and decide that things aren't working and that you need to do something different. But yeah, this is an incredible way of life. And for me, it's about being able to steward a piece of land and feel like I am caretaking something for a brief period of time. Nothing in life is permanent, including land ownership, but the land will still be here. And the idea that I'm gonna leave this piece of ground better than I found it. This piece of ground that we're on has been farmed for over a hundred years. And so I'm part of that long legacy. And I love thinking about, you know, somebody 50 years from now who's also on this piece of ground, hopefully stewarding it um, in a way that keeps it healthy and whole for the next generation.
Thanks for watching Tribe. If you like this kind of content, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, leave me a comment and share. I have new content coming out every week.